Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, brings you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Gene Tierney and Victor Mature in Laura. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's drama is such a fascinating combination of mystery and romance that it is rapidly becoming a classic to the devoted readers of whodunits. Perhaps its main attraction is its unusual triangle of characters. The cynical Broadway columnist, the soft-spoken detective, or the haunting picture of Laura herself. Regardless of the reason, this intriguing mystery is one of 20th Century Fox's most memorable screen hits. And as our stars, we have glamorous Jean Tierney in her original role, romantically teamed with one of our most popular stars, Victor Mature. But first, let's hear from Ken Carpenter. I don't know about you, but through the years, the Carpenters have washed a lot of dishes with a lot of different products. And when Lever Brothers came out with Lux Liquid Detergent, well, we saw all our dishwashing problems go right down the drain. Really, nothing beats Lux Liquid for doing dishes fast and easy. Well, you just put one teaspoonful of Lux Liquid into the dishpan, put in the plates and glasses, and your work is virtually done. Lux Liquid's wonderful up-to-the-minute formula cuts through grease like nothing you've ever seen. The minute you take the dishes out of the dishpan, even before you rinse and stack them, you'll see they're glistening clean. And how, you ask, does Lux Liquid score on mildness? Well, just as you'd expect, a Lux product, too. According to my wife, Lux liquid's easier on her hands than anything she's ever used in the dishpan. And, of course, another thing we like about Lux liquid is the way it comes in a can that won't break with that magic dripless spout that ends messy handling. Truly, once you try Lux liquid, and uh, do so soon, you'll reach for it come dishes time just as naturally as you'd reach for Lux flakes when you wash nylon. And I know how women like Mrs. Carpenter count on Lux Flakes. They know how gentle Lux Flakes care is, how it can double the life of nylons, pair after pair. Yes, no matter what anyone else says, 96% of stocking manufacturers recommend Lux Flakes. If both Lux Liquid and Lux Flakes aren't everything Lever Brothers say they are, they'll refund the purchase price. Fair enough? So get both, won't you? Now, Act One of Laura. Starring Gene Tierney in the title role and Victor Mature as Lieutenant McPherson. Most people who read a newspaper or listen to the radio know the name Paul Leidecker. Mr. Leidecker is a legendary oracle of Bob Wire and Forget Me Nots, whose enchanted pen and acid tongue have brought fame to hundreds and oblivion to just as many. His New York apartment is a combination art gallery and Roman bath. And now, immersed in one of his marble pools, Mr. Leidecker has a visitor, Detective Lieutenant Mark McPherson of the Homicide Bureau. Say, it's a nice little place you have here, Mr. Leidecker. It's lavish, but I call it home. Well, you'll hear about the murder of Laura Hunt. I made my statement yesterday to Sergeant Detective Crane. Yes, I know. Now, suppose you tell me what else you know. <laughs> Why not? Oh, uh, hand me that washcloth, Mr. McPherson. Uh... Oh, yes, yes. How good a detective are you? Oh, I've picked up a few facts. Laura Hunt was killed the night before last. The bell rang. She opened the door and someone pulled the trigger of a shotgun. It wasn't nice. The range was close. Have you found the shotgun? No. What else? Well, Miss Hunt was a very good-looking girl, probably. She was about 25, lived in a swell apartment... Had a maid named Bessie. And where did she get the wherewithal to support such a menage? The Bullet Company. Advertising agency. She had a good job. Art director or something. Uh, Not or something. She has a lady cousin in town and a couple of boyfriends. One named Shelby Carpenter and the other is Paul Leidecker. Well, today is Sunday. Why haven't you tried to see me? Because it's a peculiar case and I want to think. Well, if you wait, I'll go with you when you leave. Why? Murder's my favorite crime. My radio audience loves it. I know you'll visit all your suspects. I'd like to study their reactions. 
You're on the list yourself, you know. I'd be insulted if I weren't. Were you in love with Laura Hunt, Mr. Lydiger? Was she in love with you? Laura considered me the wisest, the wittiest, the most interesting man she'd ever met. I was in complete accord with her on that point. Uh, now, if you will excuse me, I'll get dressed. Oh, uh, where shall we be stopping first, Lieutenant? I'd like to see Laura Hunt's cousin. Oh, Mrs. Anne Treadwell. Yes. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> So, if you don't mind, Mrs. Treble, I'd like to ask you a few questions. I'll do anything I can to help. Oh, good morning, Paul. Good morning, Anne. You were fond of your cousin, Mrs. Treble. I adored Laura. Paul can tell you. I can tell you considerable. Did you approve of Miss Hunt's coming marriage to Mr. Carpenter? Why shouldn't I approve? I don't know. Just what does Shelby Carpenter mean to you, Mrs. Treadwell? To me? Well, he comes here regularly. Is he a friend? An acquaintance? Or are you in love with him? <laughs> This is beginning to assume fabulous aspects. Well? Um, I'm very fond of Shelby, of course. Everybody is. I despise him. You've been withdrawing a lot of cash from your bank, Mrs. Treadwell. Fifteen hundred and seventeen hundred at a clip. I needed that money. The day you took out fifteen hundred, Carpenter deposited thirteen hundred and fifty. When you withdrew seventeen, he deposited fifteen. Shooting craps, Anne? Oh, must I be insulted like this? Shelby needed some money. I lent it to him. I supposed I could do with it as I pleased. Of course. Now, on Friday night, you were home alone. Why didn't you go to the concert with Mr. Carpenter? Concert? I... I didn't go because he didn't ask me. Well, hello. Oh, we were just talking about you, Carpenter. What a coincidence to find you here. This is Lieutenant McPherson. Yes, we've met. I didn't know you were here, Carpenter. I've been lying down. My hotel room is so hot, and then all the reporters and the telephone. You know how it is, Lieutenant. Is that a sign of guilt or innocence, McPherson? I'm as eager to find a murderer as you are, Lieutenant. Laura and I are going to be married lad, this week, you know. No, he doesn't know, and neither do I, nor you, nor anyone else. Oh? Laura had not definitely made up a mind to marry him. She told me so herself. She was going to the country to think it over. Laura was extremely kind, but she'd never have thrown her life away on a male beauty in distress. I suppose you've heard losers whine before, Lieutenant. Yesterday you said you went to that concert Friday night, Mr. Carpenter. What did they play? Mm, some Brahms, Beethoven's Ninth. Uh-huh. This place Miss Hunt had in the country, have you got a key to it? No, but I think there's one in her apartment. Well, uh, I'll have a look. Perhaps I could help you. Okay. Come along. Goodbye, Mrs. Treble. <laughs> Well, you can start looking for that key now, Carpenter. Oh, yes, yes. I'll try the den. Excuse me. Say, that's the dame's portrait on the wall, isn't it? Will you stop calling Laura a dame? That portrait was painted by Joseph Carter. He was in love with her. Have you ever been in love, McPherson? Yeah. A doll in Washington Heights once got a fox fur out of me. <laughs> Have you ever known a woman who wasn't a doll or a dame? Yeah, one. But she kept walking me past furniture stores. <laughs> well, where are you going? Oh, a phonograph. Hey, there's a record on it. Selections from Bittersweet. One of Laura's favorites. Not exactly classical, but very nice. Say, uh, you know quite a bit about music, don't you? I don't know a lot about anything, Lieutenant, but I know a little about practically everything. Then why did you say they played Brahms and Beethoven at that concert? They played nothing but Sibelius. Did they? Well, to be perfectly honest, I fell asleep and I didn't hear a note. I know it sounds phony, but I'm just a natural-born suspect. Well, don't let that bother you, Mr. Carpenter. I fall asleep at concerts myself. You, uh, find the key? No, but maybe it's in here, in her desk. Wait, yes, it is. I knew there'd be one somewhere. Funny. The police looked in that desk yesterday. The drawer was empty. You had the key right along, didn't you, Carpenter? Yes. I didn't want to give it to you while Lidecker was present. I have private reasons that don't concern him. You have private reasons, no doubt, to lie about that key. Paul, I'm warning you to stop implying I had anything to do with Laura's death. Very well, I'll stop implying. I'll make a direct statement. You asked for this, Paul. All right, all right. Cut it out, both of you. Yeah. Okay. Now, look. We came here to find the key, and I've got the key. Now, let's get out. There's nothing more you want from me? No, not now. Well, I'll run along, then. <laughs> you, um... 
having lunch, Lieutenant? Yes, I guess so. There's a rather superior restaurant nearby. Okay, let's go. Nice, quiet little place, Mr. Leidiger. Yes. Say, what's the matter? You wouldn't call me a sentimental person, would you, Lieutenant? Well, not... Dozens of times we sat here, this very table, Laura and I. Well, how long did you know her? Nearly five years. I was just thinking, here we are eating lunch, and it was at lunch that I first met Laura. The Algonquin Hotel. I was alone. I looked up and found her standing in front of me. She had a layout in her hand, a sample advertisement. Mr. Lidecker, how do you do? I'm Laura Hunt. Well? I'd like to talk something over with you, if I may. I am eating my lunch. Yes, but it's practically impossible to get to see you, and I... Either you're from some incredibly remote community where good manners are unknown, or you suffer from the common delusion that being a female exempts you from all the rules of civilized conduct. (laughs) Possibly. But I wanted to show this to you. It's an ad for the Wallace Flow Wright pen. You're such a famous writer and commentator. It would be tremendously helpful if you'd endorse what we say about the Flow Wright pen. I don't use a pen. I write with a goose quill dipped in poison. And you may tell your employers... Oh, that... they don't know anything about this. It was all my idea. They'd give you anything to get your endorsement. And if I were the person you getting it... You disregard one... completely something far more important to me than your career. Oh? My food. You mean that, don't you? Of course I mean it. I never heard of anything so selfish. In my case, self-absorption is completely justified. I have never discovered any subject quite so worthy of my attention. But in your column, on the radio, the things you say, they're filled with such understanding, such sentiment. Miss Hunt, you are beginning to bore me. You're a poor man, Mr. Lidecker. I feel very sorry for you. Goodbye. In my second meeting with Laura Hunt, occurred about two hours later, Lieutenant. Oh, she uh, kept after you, did she? No, I went to her because I couldn't stop thinking about her. She had something, that girl, something far deeper than good looks. I went to Bulletin Company and proceeded to do something I have carefully avoided since the age of two. I apologize. Your apology is accepted, Mr. Lidecker. It was very nice of you to go to all this trouble. Goodbye. Uh, uh, Miss Hunt, for reasons which are too embarrassing to mention, I'd like to endorse the Wallace Flowright pen. You're a very strange man. Now I'm sure you're sorry for the way you acted. Uh, let's not get psychiatric, but in a word, yes. And you're a very kind person. No, I'm vicious. It's the real secret of all my charm. But uh, if you think me kind, I'll call for you here at six. What? We'll have dinner together. I can't make it any later. Uh, will you be ready? Why, yes. I'll be ready. Coffee, Mr. Lidecker? Oh, thanks, Lieutenant. I started then to help Laura. I am a man reputedly of overwhelming ego, Lieutenant. But this, I admit without reserve, it was Laura's own talent, her own incredible charm, that enabled her to rise to the very top of her profession. Through me, Laura met everyone, the famous and the infamous, and deferring always to my taste and judgment, she captivated them all. Well, uh, when does Carpenter enter the picture? Men couldn't keep away from Laura, but she never regarded anyone seriously but me. As for Carpenter, she met him one night at a party at Ann Treadwell's. She became attracted to him instantly. I was shocked. A fellow completely without talent, with as much depth of character as a saucer of stale gin. Shortly before I took Laura home, I heard her talking with him. And so I spend my time doing what I've always done, nothing. (laughs) <laughs> then tell me, what does it feel like living on the income from an estate? I once knew what it felt like, uh, but the sheriff interfered with that over ten years ago. Then why don't you work for a living? Well, I did ask a friend for a job. All he did was laugh. He thought I was joking. Weren't you? Oh, no. And when he saw I was sincere, he got embarrassed. He said he'd phone me. <laughs> that was months ago. Do you really want a job? Yes, I do. Then you've got one. What? Now you think I'm joking. Well, I'm not. You just be at Bulletin Company tomorrow morning. You're going to work, Mr. Carpenter. And so in time, Mr. Lidecker, they got engaged, huh? They became attached to each other quickly. I concealed my annoyance with masterly self-control, but here was a situation, however ridiculous, that required my attention. And as you will see, it was for Laura's own good. 
Well, I followed them one night to this very restaurant. They had been working late on some advertising campaign. The idea is wonderful, Shelby, and so are the layout. By the way, who's the model you use? You don't remember. You hired her yourself. Uh, Diana Redford. Oh, of course. Laura, could you have dinner with me tomorrow night just like this? Maybe. And what about the night after that? But, Shelby, I just can't... What about three weeks from tonight and all the nights in between? Don't you think I have any other engagement? What about two months from now and the month after that? (laughs) What about next year? Then it's all settled. What about breakfast? What about lunch? Beautiful lunches day after day after day. What about beautiful work day after day? Why, Miss Hunt, the way you talk, you'd think I was in love with you. (laughs) Sparkling bit of dialogue, wasn't it, Lieutenant McPherson? If they knew you were listening, they might have jazzed it up a bit. (laughs) Laura knew that I had overheard them because I told her so the following evening. By then, I had some other information to tell her also. I don't care what you found out about Shelby. It's the snooping about, Paul. It's degrading. Of course. But I thought you'd want to know that Sterling character almost went to jail last year for passing rubber checks. After that, in Virginia, he was suspected of stealing his hostess's jewelry. Those are only insinuations. I know his fault. But a man can change, can't he? Oh, Laura, for heaven's sake, open your eyes. So Carpenter has changed. Yes, he's changed from you to Diana Redfern. He's running around with her now, a model from your own office. Paul, oh, how can you be so despicable? You know what you mean to me. How can you try so deliberately to hurt me? Hurt you? Paul, well, Shelby and I are going to be married. Next week. You gave him a cigarette case on his birthday, didn't you? A valuable case. Here. Where did you get it? From the pawn shop where Diana Redfern took it after he gave it to her. I don't believe it. He probably needed money and was too proud to borrow. Perhaps that's why this pawn ticket is in her name. I won't let this go any further. I'm going to telephone him. You won't find him at his hotel. Tonight, Carpenter's deserted both you and Miss Redfern. He's dining with a young and wealthy widow, someone you know, your cousin Anne. And he's been treating her rather badly these days. I'll phone Anne at once. Oh, really, my dear? You don't think Anne would give him away? Oh, this is nasty, I know, but I must make you realize. Now, suppose we visit Cousin Anne. He won't be there. I know he won't. Oh, good evening, Miss Laura. Good evening, Mr. Lydecker. Hello, Margaret. Oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, but Mrs. Treadwell isn't at home. Satisfied, Paul? Then suppose we just wait for her. Oh, please, Mr. Lydicker. Come in, Laura. Why, Laura, dear, and Paul. We were just having dinner. Yes, I know. Uh, Laura, I I didn't expect to see you tonight. There you are, Laura. In a moment of supreme disaster, he's trite. I was uh, just telling Anne about our getting married. Uh, Well, sit down, you two. Oh, no. No, thanks. I just stopped by to give you this. Your cigarette case. What? You must have misplaced it somewhere. Laura, Laura, wait a minute. Uh, uh... Good night, Anne. Good night, Shelby. When was this episode of the cigarette case, Mr. Lidecker? Last Wednesday night. On Friday, Laura had lunch with the Redfern girl. Oh? I wish I'd been there. And as I said in my statement, Laura and I were to have had dinner that night. At 7 o'clock, my phone rang. I don't know, I had a sudden sensation of depression, a foreboding of disaster. Hello? Paul, I'm frightfully sorry, but I just can't meet you. Well, there's nothing wrong, Laura. I mean, you're not ill. Oh, no, no. I I just decided to go to the country for a few days. In this storm? It's pouring. It won't last. Paul, it will do me a lot of good to be alone. You're thinking about Carpenter. Of course. Please, I I simply must have this time to think this out for myself. Well, when will you be back, dear? I don't know. I'll call before I leave. Maybe you could meet me. Of course I will. Thanks, Paul. Goodbye. Goodbye, my dear. That was the last time I ever heard her voice. This, um, this Redfern girl. Where does she live? In Newark. She's in the phone book. I will never forgive myself for allowing Laura to become involved with Carpenter. It was my fault. I should have stopped it long ago somehow. She's dead now. It's too late even to think about it. Yes, too late even to think about it.
Act two of Laura, starring Gene Tierney in the title role and Victor Mature as Mark, with Joseph Kearns as Paul Lydica and Carlton Young as Carpenter. It's an hour later. In front of Laura Hunt's apartment, Lieutenant Detective Mark McPherson picks up Sergeant Crane. Together, they make another thorough search of the girl's room. Two things interest McPherson. A pile of Laura's letters and a bottle of Scotch whiskey. If you're thirsty, Lieutenant, I think you can do better than that. No, thanks. Say, uh, when did you say that maid was due? Any minute now. Say, where's McAvity? In the basement. I've had the telephone tapped. He's sitting on it. But who's going to use the phone besides us? Nobody I know of, but it's still a good idea. I'm making a call now myself. Go down in the basement and relieve Mac. I'll wait here for the maid. Carpenter's coming, too. Okay. Hello? Moscones? This is Lieutenant McPherson, homicide. Laura Hunt's been buying liquor from you, hasn't she? Yeah. Did she ever buy a brand of scotch called Black Pony? You're sure of that? Okay, thanks. Come in, Miss Clary. Never mind that Miss Clary stuff. My name's Bessie. Have a chair, Bessie. It seems to me you... Those letters... You've been reading her private letters. Yeah. Cops. I was brought up to spit whenever I saw one. Well, if it makes you feel any better, Bessie, spit. <laughs> Bessie, who killed Laura Hunt? How would I know? If you think I'd done it, ask anyone, anyone who ever came here. Why, I'd worked for her, scrubbed for her, done anything she would have wanted of me, pay or no pay. Say, you're loyal, Bessie. Miss Hunt was a real lady. Something cops wouldn't know about. How'd this bottle get into her cabinet? I put it there. It's cheap scotch, Bessie. Laura Hunt wouldn't buy cheap scotch. I found it on a kitchen shelf Saturday morning. You know what that means? It means that somebody brought it here Friday night. Who? I don't know. But I, I didn't want anybody to get any wrong idea about her. God rest her soul. That's why I put the bottle in the liquor cabinet. I'd done more than that. There were two glasses. I washed them out and cleaned off the bottle, too. Destroying evidence, Bessie. Well, I don't care. I'll do anything to keep her name from being dragged through the mud. Now, relax, Bessie. Just relax. Look, I'd like some ice in the setup. Do you mind? Oh, and uh, a couple of highball glasses. I'm expecting somebody. More cops? No. Shelby Carpenter. Let him in and uh, then get the glasses. The door was open, Lieutenant. Oh, Mrs. Treadwell, come in. I didn't expect you. Oh, are you either, uh, Mr. Lidecker? Shelby's dropping me at the hairdressers later. I only sent for you, Carpenter. I know. So I thought I might as well come along. My excuse is equally feeble. I dropped in to inquire as to the state of your health, Lieutenant. Insipid, I trust. I was about to have a drink. Oh, uh, Bessie, two more glasses. Yes, sir. Scotch, uh, Lydica? Excellent. Will this do? It's Black Pony. I'm a guest here. It will have to do. Here's the ice and the glasses. That'll be all, Bessie. You can go home now. Oh, but I... Yes, sir. I'll go. Thank you, Bessie. I remember when Laura bought these glasses. She loved them. She loved all her things so. What are you going to do, Anne? Sell them? I suppose so, if I'm appointed administrator. I'll probably call in Corey. Corey? The art dealer? Yes, he can dispose of everything. It'll be less... less gruesome that way. Uh, not quite everything, Anne. There are one or two things here that belong to me. That vase, for instance. Uh, the antique fire screen and, of course, the clock. That's, uh, quite a clock. You've got one just like it, haven't you? I noticed it in your apartment. Uh, they were made 200 years ago by Courbet Fils. Large, aren't they? Two clocks exactly the same, created at the order of the Prince of Wales. I lent one to Laura. Oh, really, Paul? Yes, really. But the vase is the gem of my collection. I can take it with me now. Nothing's leaving here, Lydica. Only you. Is that your quaint way of indicating dismissal? We're all leaving. I don't understand. I thought you sent for I me. did. Well, don't you want to ask me any questions? Nothing pressing. I see. Well, I bid you goodbye. Oh, the uh, vase, Mr. Lydiger. Put it down. Uh, oh, of course. <laughs> Just a touch of kleptomania. Uh, <laughs> Crane. Yeah? McPherson, I'm back. Upstairs in her apartment. How are you doing in the basement? Any calls come in this afternoon? Not a thing. Look, I've just been looking this place over. 
I've only done it 40 times. Anything interesting? Everything's interesting. Especially that portrait. A really beautiful doll, Lieutenant. Yeah. You know, I've read her letters, smelled her perfume, drank her scotch, and gone through her wardrobe. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah? Someone in the hall. Look, it's 7 o'clock. Alfred will be along to relieve you. Make sure Alfred keeps his ear on that phone. Right. Who is it? Guess. Coming, Ladiger. I guess you just happened to be passing by. And I noticed the lights were on. Have you sublet this apartment, McPherson? You're here often enough to pay rent. Any objections? Yes. Especially to your prying into Laura's letters. That bundle in your pocket, for instance. Oh, these. <laughs> They're yours. The best of the bunch, too. That's the trouble with getting murdered, Leidecker. It ruins your privacy. And have detectives who buy portraits of murder victims a claim to privacy? Lancaster Corey tells me you've already put in a bid for Laura's portrait. That's none of your business. McPherson, did it ever strike you that you're acting very strangely? Yeah, it's a wonder you don't come here with roses and a box of drugstore candy. Have you been dreaming of Laura as your wife by your side at the policeman's ball or in the bleachers? Or listening to the heroic saga of how you acquired a silver shin bone in a gun battle with a gangster? Yes, I can see that you have. Why don't you go home? I'm busy. Perhaps we can come to terms now. You want her portrait? Perfectly understandable. I want my possessions, my bars, my clock, my fire screen. Now, if you... Get going. Oh, you'd better watch out, Lieutenant. You'll end up in the psychiatric ward. I don't think they've ever had a patient who fell in love with a beautiful girl who died before he met her. Or did you meet her? Well, good night, person. What's the matter with me? Maybe, maybe you can tell me. You, the girl in that portrait up there. You're beautiful. You're the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Somebody killed you. Why? Why? Do you know I could sit here and look at you all night? All night long, I could sit and just look at you. Who is it? Who's in there? You. You! What are you doing here? You're, you're alive. If you don't get out at once, I'll call the police. You are Laura Hunt, aren't you? Well, I'm aren't going you? to call the police. Look, I am the police. See? Credentials. Lieutenant Mark McPherson. What's all this about? You don't know. You don't know what's happened. No. Well, haven't you seen the paper? Where have you been? In the country. I, I don't get a newspaper. Well, haven't you got a radio? It was broken. What are you... Here, here. Look at all these headlines. I want you to sit down, Miss Hunt. You know, I'm very glad to see you. On Friday night, somebody was murdered in this room. What did you say? Until you opened the door just now. We thought it was you. Do you have any idea who it could have been? You don't know? The girl died from shotgun wounds. No. Apparently, we don't know. Who had a key to this apartment? Nobody except my maid. When did you say it happened? Friday night. Look, you'd better take off that coat. You're dripping wet. Say, when did this start raining? Just a few minutes ago. It's teeming outside. It was raining Friday night, too, when that girl... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Raining. Come with me, Miss Hunt. Here in your room. I want you to look into your closet. I simply don't understand. The closet, Miss Hunt. The closet. Here, open it up. Do all those dresses belong to you? Certainly they belong to All me. of them? Are you out of your mind? Of course they do. What's this one? I don't know. You tell me. Why, this dress isn't mine. It's hers, Diana Redfern. She had it on when she came for lunch on Friday. Ah, I see. But this dress wasn't, this dress wasn't in here when I left. It wasn't. This Miss Redfern, is she about your size? Yes, she's a model. She works for us. Yes, but she hasn't been home. Her landlady said she's gone to Philadelphia. That's right. We have a branch office in Philadelphia. She had an assignment there, but she didn't go. It was postponed. Does she have any relatives in the city? An aunt and an uncle. The same name. They live in the village. Thanks. Where are you going? To the telephone. I think Miss Redfern's aunt and uncle 
I'd better go to the morgue right away to make an identification. Identify? Oh, no. No. Right. Yes, sir. I will. So long, Inspector. Well, that's that, Miss Hunt. They've located the red fern? Yes. We ought to know soon. Miss Hunt, when you went to the country Friday, did you see anyone you knew on the train? No. What happened? I got off at Norwalk. I keep a car in a private garage near the station. I drove to my house. It's about 18 miles. What did you do in the country? Worked in my garden. You didn't leave your place in all that time? I keep everything I need in the house. I went there expressly to be alone. Uh Uh-huh. You were going to marry Shelby Carpenter this week. Yes. But you went away for a long weekend to be alone. You know Shelby Carpenter has a key to this apartment. Why didn't you tell me? Because I know nothing of the sort. He hasn't. How else did the Redfern girl get into the apartment? You knew she was in love with Carpenter? I also knew that she meant nothing to Shelby. I understand him better than you. She was found. And I'm convinced now it was Miss Redfern. She was found in your dressing gown. What of it? You yourself told me it was raining Friday night. You yourself just saw her dress. It's full of wrinkles and rain. Well, how did she get in here? Why? Who brought her here? I haven't the slightest idea. Look, Miss Hunt, do you love this carpenter fellow so much you'd risk your own safety to protect him? He must have brought her here. You suspect me. You think I killed somebody in jealousy. I'm trying to get at the truth. I'm sorry. Strictly routine. Look, Miss Hunt. I'll see you in the morning. Meanwhile, don't leave this apartment and don't use the telephone. But I've got to use it. I've got to let my friends know I'm alive. Sorry, but I must insist. You see, if anything should happen to you, I... Well, I wouldn't like it. All right. There's one more thing. You want a way to make up your mind whether you'd marry Shelby Carpenter or not? What did you decide? I decided not to marry him. Well, well, well. I'll see you in the morning, Miss Hunt. Good night. Good night. Alfred? That you, Mark? Yeah. Watch your step. It's pretty dark down here. Anything come through those earphones? Morg just called. It was the red friend girl, all right. They said she... Wait a minute. She's dialing a number off. Give me those earphones. Hello? Shelby, this is Laura. I just... Laura! I must tell you... Don't say anything on the telephone. Meet me right away. In front of the office. Can you leave? Right away. Was that... Yeah, dames are always pulling a switch on you. You stay here, Alfred. Mac out in front? Yeah. Get headquarters. Tell him to send another man right away. Mac's going to tail the girl. What about you? I think I'll stick by Mr. Carpenter. See you. Act three of Laura in a moment. If you the curtain rises on Act Three of Laura, starring Gene Tierney in the title role, and Victor Mature as Mark with Joseph Kearns as Paul Lydiger. For three hours, Detective Lieutenant McPherson has been following Shelby Carpenter. Now in the black hours of the night, he stops his car near a lonely house, 18 miles from Norwalk, and makes his way carefully toward the front door. It's not quite shut. He peers through the crack for a moment, and then walks in. Uh, What? What are you doing with that shotgun, Carpenter? I I must admit, this is somewhat embarrassing. Let me see that gun. It's been fired recently. I uh, killed some rabbits with it. When? A while back. I don't know exactly. I... Gave the gun to Laura for protection. You haven't borrowed it lately. You didn't just bring it back. You ought to know. You've been following me. Do you realize the spot you're in? You brought Diana Redfern to Laura's apartment. You knew all along it was she who was murdered. Didn't you know Laura would come back any day and spill the whole thing? 
Or did you plan to kill her, too? You're being fantastic. You took a bottle of Black Pony to her house Friday night. I took it there over a week ago. Bessie says Friday night. I can't help what Bessie says. Where's the key to Laura's apartment? I haven't got one. I never had one. Okay, you didn't bring the scotch there Friday night. You never had a key. Now, how did you get in? Well, I... Oh, come on, Carpenter. Talk, talk. Well, Laura kept an extra key in her office. I had asked Diana to meet me in a restaurant. I wanted to have it out with her once and for all. You know, she thought she, well, that she was in love with me. She started to get hysterical, and we had to leave. Well, we started to walk. It began to rain suddenly, and we got drenched. I thought of the key and stopped by the office to get it. We couldn't find a taxi, so we walked back to Laura's apartment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Diana went to Laura's bedroom. When she came out, she had on a dressing gown. Well, we talked, argued maybe for a couple of hours, and then the doorbell rang. Why didn't you go to the door? Suppose one of Laura's friends had found me there. Well, what would they think of finding Diana there? I told her to say that Laura had lent her the apartment. Anybody who knew Laura would believe that. All right, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I heard Diana open the door, and then there was an awful explosion. By the time I reached her, the door was shut again. Diana just lay there on the floor. Did you go out to see who did it? I was too horrified to do anything. I... I knew I had to keep out of it and keep Laura out of it, too. The only thing on my mind was the safety of the person whose life was dearer to me than my own. Don't you understand that? Did you think Laura had killed her, did you? I don't remember what I thought. Well, do you think so now? No. Look, on Saturday, when Detective Crane went to see you, you seemed sincerely shocked. I was. I hadn't expected the police to mistake Diana's body for Laura's. And your alibi was ready. The concert. You knew the minute Laura got back to town, it wouldn't stick. I couldn't think that far ahead. I was heartbroken about Diana and panic-stricken about Laura. Okay. And tonight you met Laura in front of her office. What did you talk about? About what I've just told you. What are you turning on the radio for? To see if it works. Why don't you tell the truth? She sent you here to get rid of that gun. She doesn't even know I came. It was my own idea. Oh. The radio works fine, doesn't it? Why wouldn't it? I hoped it wouldn't. All right, we're driving back to New York. Am I under arrest? I don't know. Just don't leave town. It would be a very foolish thing to do. Oh, good morning, Lieutenant. Good morning. You know, I have a terrific yen to call you, Lord. Why don't you forget that lieutenant business and call me Mark? Because I... Especially since I brought you all these groceries. Look, you know, uh, you didn't buy any food when you went out last night. So you know. Yeah. I can fix uh, bacon and eggs. Can you make coffee? Oh, I spoke to Bessie. She'll be a little late. When I told her you were alive, she... Darn near passed out. Yes, she phoned. You might have been a little more delicate about it. Suppose you set the table. But we'll have to wait a little while for the coffee. I asked Paul Ivigo to stop by. Did you tell him about me, that I'm alive? No. Why not? It's brutal. I'm not doing it for laughs. Why did you uh, break your promise last night? Not to go out? Because I'll never be bound to do anything unless it's of my own free will. The Redfern girl was in love with Carpenter. You admitted that. I also told you he wasn't in love with her. Paul? I don't know. You stay here. Hello, Lieutenant. Laura? Oh, good morning, darling. Hello, dear. Excuse me, Lieutenant. I'd like to kiss my fiancé good morning. Oh, so it's on again. Do I have to get a police permit? Oh, now who? Come in, Lydecker. The door's unlatched. Lydecker, right on my heels. Well, McPherson, have you thought over the deal I suggested? What about the portrait of... Horror! Oh, Paul! Oh. Oh. I, I, I'd be all right in, 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 a, in a moment. Laura, what a... Not now, dear. Don't try to talk now. Come on, come on. I'll take him into the bedroom. Just be quiet, Laura. Yes. Yes. How is he now, McPherson? Ah, oh, he'll be all right. He's lying down. This is going just a little too far. Your methods are vicious. Must have been a terrible shock to him, seeing me, poor darling. Now, don't tell me you're in love with Lidecker, too. Stop talking that way to Miss Hunt. Laura, why do you cover up for a guy like Carpenter? What story did he tell you when you met him last night? Don't answer him, darling. Oh, shut up. I got enough Carpenter to set you away right now. McQuer McPherson, quick the handcuffs. Trundle him off to the Hoosgow. Paul, 
Oh, well, I hope you'll forget my wee touch of angina, my dear. It's an old family custom. Oh, did I interrupt a pinch, McPherson? No. I've changed my mind for the moment. Well, in that case, better order some food and liquor, Laura. People are coming to celebrate your return this afternoon. A cocktail party. Who asked them? I did in the quiet of your boudoir just now. I called my man and he's calling all our dear friends. Why did you have to do that? Perhaps our friends can weave all the loose ends into a noose. Eh, McPherson? Now, you shouldn't have gone to all that trouble, Attica. Well, Laura, I'll run along. Uh, sorry about breakfast. Some other time, maybe. Shelby. Shelby, come here. What's the matter, darling? Your party's a huge success. Shelby, tell me. I must know. Why did you go to the country last night? Laura, you don't know. I was afraid you wouldn't think of hiding that shotgun. What shotgun? The one I gave you. Oh, darling, you don't have to lie to me. Well, what's going on here? Oh, nothing at all, Anne. In case you don't know it, that McPherson man hasn't taken his eyes off you. I know. Uh, maybe it'd be better if uh, I will mingle with the guests. Laura, McPherson suspects him. Shelby. He suspects me, too. <laughs> don't be absurd. Darling. Yes? Are you as interested in Lieutenant McPherson as he is in you? And I only met him last night. Sometimes that's more than long enough. Anyway, he's better for you than Shelby. Anybody is. Shelby's better for me. Why? Because I can afford him. He's no good, but... Wait a minute. He's coming, Mark. Oh? Mark, is he? I'm sorry to break up your party, Laura. But you haven't. You've been a model guest so far. I'm not joking, Laura. Get your things. I'm taking you to headquarters. <laughs> I thought I was going to get a cell in a denim dress. Is this your offer? Now, before they trot out that denim dress, I want to know why you've been holding out on me. Have I been? You told me the radio at your country place was broken. It was. Not last night. I stopped in the village on my way back. I asked the local handyman to fix it. Well, how did he get in? With a key. The key I always leave under the flower pot on the porch. All right, I'll accept that. Why? Because you're too intelligent to make up a story I could check so easily. The main thing I want to know is why you pulled that switch about Shelby Carpenter. You told me last night you decided not to marry him. But today it's on again. Why? I changed my mind. What went on between you and Carpenter when you met him last night? Or should I tell you? He convinced you that if you broke your engagement now, people would think you believed that he killed Diana Redford. Yes, but now I know the real reason why he wanted to stay engaged. He thinks I did it, and so do you. Are you in love with him? No. I don't know how I ever could have been. Come on, Laura. You're going home. But I thought I was under... That's what I wanted you to think. You and a few other people. And all this was just some sort of a game? Well, I was 99% certain about you. But I just had to make sure that 1% doubt. Wasn't there an easier way to make sure? Say, you're, you're smiling. You're not sore? No, Mark, I'm not sore. You go back to your party, <laughs> if there's anything left of it. And you? I'm going to Livelycoe's department. I'll drop by later on. <laughs> I'm glad they've all gone, Laura. It's been so long since we've been together. Darling, what's the matter? Nothing, Paul. You're worried. Yes, McPherson. He's using you for something. I don't think so. Oh, I don't deny he's infatuated with you in some warped fashion. But he's incapable of any normal human relationship. He's been dealing too long with criminals. When you were unattainable, when he thought you were dead... That's when he wanted you most. He fell in love with a portrait. He was glad when I came back, as if he were waiting for me. Do you know what he calls women? Dames. A dame in Washington Heights once got a fox fur out of him. His very words. That doesn't mean anything, Paul. Laura, my dear, you have one glaring weakness. With you, a lean, strong body is always the measure of a man. And you always get hurt. No man is ever going to hurt me again. No. Not even you. I... Hurt you? Laura, look at me. You were a long time finding out about Shelby. But that's all over now. We'll be together again. 
Wait, I thought I heard the door open. It did. Oh, don't get up. It's only me. Haven't you heard of science's latest triumph, the doorbell? I'm... <laughs> I'm glad you're here, Lydecker. I've just been to your apartment. Well, do you mind if I search your pockets? I found a shotgun. Oh? But I wasted my time. It wasn't the gun that killed Diana Redford. First he tells you that he thinks you're innocent, then he proceeds to check up on you. I never said you're innocent. Me? I'm talking about Laura. My dear, this entire maneuver could be a trick to throw you off guard. It could be, but it isn't. I know. I believe you, Mark. I'm beginning to get annoyed. Laura, it's the same obvious pattern. If McPherson weren't full of muscles and good looks in a cheap sort of way, you'd see through him in a second. Paul, I mean to be as kind about this as I know how. But you're the one following the same obvious pattern. First with that painter you thought was in love with me. Then with Shelby, and now I suppose... Laura, what are you saying? But I don't think that we should see each other again. Now, darling, you're not yourself. Yes, I am. For the first time in ages, I know what I'm doing. Very well. I hope you'll never regret what promises to be a disgustingly earthy relationship. (laughs) Oh, uh, listen to my broadcast in ten minutes. I'm discussing the other great loves of history. That was the most difficult thing I've had to do in my whole life. Yes. But where is it? Where is it? What? The gun that killed Diana Redford. What are you doing? Taking a look at your clock here. He's got one just like it, hasn't he? Yes, but... Well, you see, I wasn't alone in Lydecker's apartment. A guy named Sergeant Crane came with me. Crane's old man is a clockmaker. And while I wore myself out looking for a shotgun... All the sergeant did was drool about the clock. He said probably there's not another one like it in the world. Obviously, he was wrong. Yes. But he showed me something about that clock. A little feature with all clocks made by Corbefis. Underneath, down here near the floor, is a little spring. You push the spring and the whole bottom compartment opens up. See? Like this. But I never knew it was there. In the old days, I guess people used the compartment for a kind of a safe. Today, they use it for hiding other things. Shotguns, for instance. Oh, Mark. Yes. This is it, Laura. I'm sure of it. And it was put here by the only man who knew about this clock. Paul Lydecker. Oh, no. When the Redfern girl opened the door, this hallway was dark. Lydecker saw a girl, assumed it was you, and fired. He figured if he couldn't have you for himself, he was going to make sure no one else did. He heard Carpenter, so he hid behind the stairway outside in the corridor. Carpenter was scared to death. He got out as fast as he could. Then Lydeck slipped back in and tucked the gun away in the grandfather clock. I've felt it ever since I came back. And I'm to blame. Not for what anything I didn't do, but for what... Just it. What I didn't do. I should have stopped seeing Paul long ago. But I couldn't. I owed him too much. You know, I can understand all that. But I can't understand why you tried so hard to protect Carpenter. I was frantic you'd arrest him. I knew he wasn't guilty, but I knew Paul would do everything he could to incriminate him. It was his way of getting rid of Shelby, just as he got rid of every other man who might have meant something to me. You know, for a charming, intelligent girl, you certainly surrounded yourself with a remarkable collection of dopes. Now, look, don't touch anything. I'm leaving the gun in the clock. I'll have it picked up in the morning. You're going? Yeah. I'm picking up Lidecker now. Ma. I've got to. You know that. And look, you try to get some sleep. Sleep? Well, maybe I can. I'll read a book. Listen to the radio. Will you call me later? Sure. And you try to forget all this. Just pretend it was a bad dream. Good night, Laura. Good night, Mark. Good night. And be careful, please. gentlemen, with his final word for this evening, Mr. Paul Leidegger. As history has proved, love is eternal, the strongest motivation for man's actions throughout centuries. Love is stronger than life. It reaches beyond the dark shadows of death. May I remind you of some favorite lines of mine from Dawson's poem? They are not long, the weeping and the laughter, love and desire, and hate. I think they have no portion in us after we pass the gate. They They are not long, days days of wine wine and roses. roses. Out Out of the the misty dream, our path path emerges for a while, while, then then closes. closes. 
within a dream. That's the way it is. Have heard the voice Isn't it, of Laura? By electrical transcription. This is the sequel. There's a final irony to all of this, Laura. You know how I despise melodrama. Yet here I am, a gun in my hand, about to kill you. Paul, you've taken one life. Isn't that enough? The best part of myself, that's what you are, Laura. Do you think I'm going to leave you to the vulgar pawings of a second-rate policeman who thinks you're a dame? He'll find you, Paul. You know he will. Willie, don't you overestimate the man who thought I left here a few moments ago? All I did was wait in the hall, Laura, and then let myself in again with a key I've always had. But I'm not going to lose you, Laura. Laura! Laura, it's me, Mark. Open the door, Laura. Don't move, Laura. He didn't leave. He's somewhere in this building, Laura. Are you all right? Find us together, darling, as always we should have been, as always we will be. No, Paul, no! Turn your face, darling, please turn your face. I couldn't bear to... Sorry, Miss Hunt, but I had to do it. I better let the boss in before he puts down you. Laura, darling, Laura! It's all right. Are you all right? Got him through the window, Lieutenant, from the fire escape. I'll call headquarters. A fine detective. A fine detective I am. Laura, goodbye. Goodbye, my love. Ma. Oh, Ma. Oh, Ma. It's all right, darling. It's all right. The bad dream is all over. In a moment, our stars will return. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. And please step forward for a well-deserved curtain call. Gene Tierney and Victor Mature. <laughs> and I can't tell you how proud I am. When I recall that I directed each of you in your first starring role. You know, Irving, I'll never forget you either. You kept me up one day on a Ferris wheel for two hours, going round and round and round. <laughs> that was a long time. Why wouldn't he let you down? Because he knew I wouldn't go up again, especially after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> what Vic didn't know was that I was riding on a crane with a camera crew, and I was just as sick as he was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you didn't beat me that way in my first starring role. It might have been my last. Oh, I'm always very charming to Lux girls, Jean. And you were a Lux girl even then, weren't you? Oh, yes. I've used Lux soap for my complexion ever since I came to Hollywood. Say, uh, Irving, Ty Pirate was also a star at 20th mm -hmm. Century Fox then. And you know now he's starring in uh, their Cinemascope production, King of Kyber Rifles. Don't you have a new Cinemascope production too, Vic? Yes. Susan Hayward and I are starred in, uh, in Demetrius and the Gladiators. I almost forgot the name. Didn't you play the part of Demetrius in the robe? Yes. And uh, 20th Century Fox received so many letters from people wondering what eventually happened to poor old Demetrius... That he decided to uh, film his story. I'd like to know myself. And Irving, I'd also like to know about next week's play. Next week, we will have another suspenseful drama. One that will take us through war-torn Europe on a thrilling hunt for a dangerous murderer. It's one of David O. Selznick's many motion picture triumphs. The Third Man. And as our stars, that excellent actor, Tyrone Power. And one of the screen's most exciting personalities, Ruth Roman. That will make a great show. Then how it will. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, and the best to both of you. Now here's Art Linkletter with a word for the busy housewife. When you're at the store pushing that metal cart around, have you ever noticed how many detergents there are? Golly, you get dizzy just looking at them. So what's a poor girl to do? Try all of them? Some people do. Generally speaking, they find that a good detergent gets things clean looking and... Well, then it doesn't make any difference which one you buy. Just close your eyes Oh, and... now, wait, wait a minute. Open your eyes when you buy that detergent. But when you're trying to find out if your wash is really clean, don't rely on looks alone. Because your nose can tell you what your eyes can't see. Oh, you mean that things aren't really clean unless they smell clean. Sure. If things don't smell clean, they aren't as clean as they should be. And like I said, all good detergents will give you a wash that's clean looking. But Surf, all-purpose Surf, will do more. Surf gets things so clean, they smell clean, too. So clean, they smell like sunshine. And that means they're clean clear through. 
One wash day with surf will prove that to you. And you won't go reaching blindly for just any detergent down at the store. You'll always reach for surf. Remember, no matter how tough a laundry job you've got, greasy work clothes and overalls, towels, sheets, surf gets things really clean. So get the big money-saving economy-sized box of surf. you like it. The Lever Brothers Company, makers of Lux Toilet Soap and Lux Liquid Detergent, invite you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Jerome Power and Ruth Roman in The Third Man. This is Irving Cummings saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in our cast tonight were Joseph Kearns as Paul, Carlton Young as Carpenter, Yvonne Patey as Anne, Doreen Camille as Bessie, Charles Seal as Crane, Eddie Marr as Alfred, and Marianne Cape as the maid. Our radio play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Rudy Schrager. Don't forget Lever Brothers' Pair and Despair plan, the smart new way to buy stockings. You get three Canon Nylon stockings, a $1.85 value for just $1, plus box tops or wrappers from Lever Brothers products. Look for details on the packages. This is your announcer, Ken Carpenter, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear The Third Man, starring Tyrone Power and Ruth Roman. Every Thursday evening, Lieber Brothers Company brings you the Lux Video Theater. Consult your local newspaper for time and station.